time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longine. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable John S. Fine, Governor of Pennsylvania. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Governor Fine, now that the conventions are over, do you think Governor Stevenson's going to be a difficult man for the Republicans to beat? Well, I don't think he's going to be difficult in the sense which your question implies. I think he'll be a worthy opponent, but I'm certain the, Demo uh, the Democrats are going to be defeated quite handily. Well, what do you think Governor Stevenson's chief strengths and weaknesses are as a candidate? Well, uh, I think his main weakness is that he has a terrific burden to bear in the brand of Trumanism. I, uh, I'm sure that uh, he cannot get away from uh, that label which is uh, impressed upon him. I, I am sure that he tried to do it by uh, being a reluctant candidate, but uh, wasn't able to uh, succeed in that respect in as much as he was again adopted uh, very thoroughly by uh, Mr. Truman at the convention. Is that your understanding of why he appeared so reluctant, sir? It was his effort to get away from the Truman label? I don't think there's any question about it. And do you think that uh, in the future now, and, and that his strategy will be to try to avoid uh, being connected with the, with the President administration as much as possible? I, I think so. I, I don't think there's any question about that. With Truman trying to get away from Trumanism himself at the convention, uh, he didn't insist upon uh, the civil rights plank in the platform uh, containing a condemnation of uh, uh, cloture, filibuster. The plank doesn't even mention uh, uh, FEPC. Uh, now, Truman could have insisted on that. He got his candidate in Stevenson. He could have gotten his platform in its completeness. Well, do you think, Governor, that the civil rights issue will be a very strong issue in this campaign? I think it's going to play a part in, in this campaign. Well, I think some of the uh, uh, northern liberals are going to insist on uh, Sparksman, uh, Sparkman, uh, the vice pre uh, presidential candidate, uh, talking uh, about uh, uh, civil rights. And uh, I'm sure that... Uh, Many of the uh, northern minorities are uh, disappointed in the plank in the Democratic platform. Well, there isn't a great difference in the uh, platform of the two parties on that issue, is there? No, I think there was uh, considerable evasion and equivocation and compromise by both parties on that uh, subject. Uh, however, the uh, Democratic Party in the past has uh, depended upon its appeal to the minorities to uh, uh, keep them in power. I think that uh, they have uh, uh, endeavored probably just a little too strenuously to get the South uh, in a good mood. And in so doing, I think they're going to lose a considerable uh, segment of the Northern vote. Well, now, as a political tactician, sir, I'm, uh, you are, and I'm interested in, in that particular tactic. Now, heretofore, as you pointed out, the Democratic Party has been successful uh, by pretty generally doing what uh, young Franklin Roosevelt and Senator Lehman uh, have wanted it to do this time, hasn't it? Yes. I mean, by a rather blatant appeal uh, to the minority groups. And this time, uh, even though President Truman indicated that he wanted to follow the same uh, policies, when they got down to the convention, there was a retreat from that, wasn't there? A disgraceful retreat, I would say. Uh, and I like the use of the word blatant. They did go out there to uh, Chicago. They made considerable noise. They forced through the convention a, a loyalty rule. And then after they got it, 
they decided they didn't want it in full and they began to retreat and they attached to that loyalty rule a proviso which gave uh, some of those southern delegations an out but the southern delegations didn't take the out they insisted on uh, sticking firm to the course with the result that uh, well they had to call Truman in and uh, Truman helped uh, through Sam Rayburn to uh, uh, have that rule practically abrogated. Well, do you think some of these young Turks, as they were called, have been completely consistent about a loyalty oath or a loyalty pledge? They have not been consistent. They, uh, they retreated in uh, uh, confusion, uh, and uh, it was a most tragic disarray of retreating troops that one could ever visualize. Well, some of those same people object to a loyalty oath, don't they, in the oh, schools and outside, they, and they were insisting on a loyalty pledge within the Democratic Party. Yes, uh, it, it is strange. The uh, ADA uh, and the Young Turks, and most of the Young Turks are ADAers, uh, they uh, insisted on the, the Southern delegations uh, taking uh, a loyalty affirmation that they would support a nominee who was not yet selected and that they uh, would have uh, compliance with a platform which was not yet formulated. Yet, uh, although they insisted on such action, they themselves object to loyalty bills being passed by legislatures which insist on uh, public employees taking an oath to their local state governments and the United States government. And of course, the United States government is a century and three quarters years old. And uh, we know what its ideals and traditions are. And we know what the platform of America is, liberty, justice, and equality. Yet they objected to that. They just don't make sense half well, the time. Well, coming back to the future issues, do you think that uh, Governor Stevenson will emphasize the prosperity issue very heavily? Well, I, I think that that's the issue which they are going to uh, 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 emphasize, probably to the exclusion of um, most other uh, uh, issues. Well, and what would be the Republican answer to that well, issue, then? Well, the Republican answer to that, of course, is that uh, the prosperity of the country is more or less synthetic, it's fictitious, it's based on a continuing war economy. Uh, today, uh, the dollar is worth about one half of what it should be worth. That affects uh, your insurance policies, it affects the man with a fixed income, it affects government bonds, and uh, it affects pensions, of, uh, particularly our elderly people, you see. And uh, I think that the Republican Party has to meet that issue head on. Coming back to the uh, convention, sir, I believe that <coughs> a great deal was said about steamrollers during the Republican convention. Uh, did you see any uh, evidence of steamrollers or bossism uh, in the Democratic convention? Well, I think that uh, the Democratic convention was the most bossed convention that we've had in the last generation or two. We it was entirely bossed. The bosses were in complete control from all the way through, you believe? Oh, no question about that. After, after the first night, the Young Turks were in control the first night, apparently, <laughs> but after that they lost the control. And that was due to the combination of the big city bosses in Chicago, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Detroit, and many other cities. And they, in conjunction with the uh, president, just controlled that convention and manipulated, uh, manipulated the way they wanted to. Well, what was the chief evidence that it was a bossed convention, as you see it, Governor? Well, uh, the chief evidence was that uh, uh, speak, uh, Speaker Rayburn, who was the permanent chairman, uh, spent uh, almost an entire night working diligently and uh, laboriously trying to uh, overrule his ruling, uh, his, against, own ruling. his own ruling against the Virginia delegation. I never saw such a pathetic and tragic thing in my life. Now, coming back to that tactic that you referred to, whereby Senator Sparkman was uh, made vice presidential nominee, you're an expert, of course, on Pennsylvania. Do you think that Sparkman's being on the Democratic ticket will make it easier to carry, for the Republicans to carry Pennsylvania this year? Unquestionably. 
You think that, uh, that General Eisenhower will carry Pennsylvania, do I, you? I feel most certain about that. And, and so you think that the, that the minorities, uh, uh, that, that this middle-of-the-road tactic and the tactic of putting Senator Sparkman on the ticket will help? I do. I, I don't think people generally uh, like to have a compromise with principles. But well, do you think there's any and serious, pardon me, do you think there's any serious prospect, Governor, of uh, General Eisenhower carrying the South? No, or I... Or any part of the South, any, I, any important state in the South? I never considered that the Republicans uh, would have much chance of carrying any of the Southern states if the Democrats had a good candidate. And I think they have a good candidate in uh, Stevenson, one who will appeal to the South, at least sufficiently to prevent the Republicans from carrying any of the southern states. As a final question, Governor Fine, you, of course, uh, got a lot of uh, publicity as a man who sat on the fence for some time, and then you jumped for General Eisenhower. <coughs> Has anything happened since then to make you regret that action? Do you still think that Eisenhower is the strong man and that he will can win the election? The, nothing has happened to make me change my mind. I can say emphatically no to that. I, I think that uh, Eisenhower is going to make a splendid candidate, and he ought to win. Well, I'm sure that our audience very much appreciates your views tonight, sir, and thank you for being with us. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable John S. Fine, Governor of Pennsylvania. More people are saying every day, let's see the world. Wherever your adventurous ideas may carry you, Europe, South America, the Middle East, or Asia, there you'll find Longines watches. It's a fact that Longines watches are sold and serviced in the principal cities of 77 countries around the free world. Discriminating people the world over find in Longines the qualities they see in a very fine watch. For only the world's most honored watch, Longines, has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from leading government observatories. Whether you go abroad or stay at home, you too will find Longines the most superior of watches. And only Longines gives you all the extras, including exclusive styling, impressive appearance, greater accuracy, and assurance of a long, long life. And yet do you know that you may buy and own or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines with Norwatch. Meet Arthur Godfrey and his friends on the CBS Television Network.